A reading, oh, a reading from Matthew eighteen six through 9. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better if you, for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Cece. Parenting children can be confusing. I don't know this because I'm a parent. I know this because I've watched parents as I have been in ministry. And I have loved and ministered to their teenagers, mostly, as they walk through life. There once was a little girl who um, wanted to have some fun one day. And her dad uh, walked into the playroom and found her brushing the dog's teeth with his toothbrush. And he was horrified and he goes, what are you doing? What, 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 what are you doing? She goes, it's okay, dad. I'm going to put it back just like I do every time. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't make up stuff. And if you're looking for biblical wisdom on children, Jesus tells us that the kind of people that would do that sort of thing, the innocent fun, the glorious chaos, are the people who are actually the best, the highest in the kingdom. We saw from our first passage in Luke, the disciples, like they sometimes do, are, are trying to argue about who's going to be the greatest. After all, Jesus is going to bring in a kingdom, right? We want to be as close to the king as we can. And so they start having this argument about which one is the greatest. What do you think, Jesus? Which one, and we see this in other gospels, as which one of us will sit at your right hand, that's the position of power, or your left hand, which was the hand you wiped yourself with in the Middle East. This is before Charmin, folks. So which one of us, Lord, will sit at the best hand and which one of us will be the second? Which one of us, Lord? And Jesus takes a child. Now, uh, now a child in those days, it wasn't that people didn't love children. It wasn't that people didn't um, care for their kids immensely. But parenting was much different back then. Children were not viewed as children. They were viewed as little adults. So all the time, children were held to adult expectations, and of course, they couldn't meet them until they were, you know, in their late twenties. So the younger you were, the lower you were on the social scale. And it's not that people didn't love their children; they just handled children in a much different way. So children were way, way down there, right about just just a, a smidge below women. Sorry, ladies. And so, Jesus takes the lowest, most powerless person on the social scale. 
It's the same story, but Matthew continues on. Matthew puts it even more powerfully and gives us words of Jesus that are even more direct and almost a little scary. He says, if any of you put a stumbling block before any one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, he says, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. And then he says, look, if anything causes you to stumble, cut it out of your life. If anything is causing you to stumble, if anything is causing you to put a stumbling block in front of a little one, and he doesn't just mean children, by the way. He means those that are vulnerable. Those that need our care. Those who are ripe to be exploited and abused. If any of us put a stumbling block in front of those little ones, woe to us and the judgment that will come upon us. So this is Jesus' worldview in a nutshell. His theology about children and little ones. And so we've got to keep that in mind as we look for biblical wisdom on raising children. Several things Jesus did, and you see it in this passage very powerfully. Jesus included children. Now, this was something that really would not have been understood in those days. People wouldn't have gotten it. Well, they can't, you know, they can't give you any money. They can't do any labor for you. They can't, uh, what, what, what's, why are kids all that useful? But Jesus took them and included them. And he did not include them by putting them on display. And you know, I've, I've seen this in some churches that I've served where, oh, they love kids. They love seeing them. And that's it. They don't want to interact with them. They don't want to be in a relationship with them. They just want to see them in church. And they want them up front on display. But that sucks the life out of kids. What children want and need from adults is a relationship. Just like Jesus gave. What children need from adults, no matter your age, no matter anything... Is for an adult to notice them and ask them questions, give them answers, show them that they care. You can tell your kids to respect you all you want, but until you include them, all they're going to do is pay lip service because you told them so. Jesus also taught kids to trust God because he trusted God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're told the, the, the command, it's the Shema of the Israelites. And it is there as they're coming into the promised land, and God reminds them, tell this story. Tell them that I am the God, the only God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and who has rescued you from bondage and is leading you to the promised land. And you find in the book of Deuteronomy over and over and over that God tells this story to the Israelites, to his children. And over and over, telling them the story of whose God he is and what he is the God of and why it is important that they believe in him. So parents, teach your children to trust God because you trust God. This goes for any adult, really. Kids need that example. I don't need you to preach to them. I'll do plenty of that. But they need you to live your faith. Teach your children to trust God because you trust God. Tell them your story of how God has worked in your life. Tell them the stories of Jesus. Tell them the tales of the Old Testament where God has redeemed people and worked in mighty ways to redeem people and help them through life. And you'll find that those stories not only will begin to make an impact on you, but as you hear your kids begin to think and digest those stories, 
you're going to find it'll inspire you too. Jesus also made a place for children in the world and included them in what he was doing. He was acutely aware of the fact that kids may not know everything yet. They may have to be taught, but they need to be included. I remember some of the most powerful times with my parents were times when I got to watch my dad do things, like dad things. Or when I got to watch my mom do things that were adult things that I didn't know how to do. And the second part of those times that made the biggest impact on me was when she began to let me, or my dad began to let me do things. And then all of a sudden I found that because my
to view the lens through view of life through the lens of a child. Help us to love those who are unloved. To help those who we may think unhelpable. And to be 